So uh, thanks for having me here today. I'm uh, Patrick Conway, as we said. I've been uh, Chief Medical Officer at CMS now for six years, which is the longest uh, serving CMO in uh, CMS Medicare Medicaid history. I don't know what that says about me or the job. Uh, true story, the other day, our communications person said, Patrick, you really need another picture. I was like, why do I need another picture? She's like, you don't look like the really young man you were when you started. <laughs> so I went home to my wife, because that's where love is found, and said, you know, honey, they said I need a new picture. She was like, yeah, you probably do need a new picture. Um, I, I love seeing Vice President Biden uh, earlier, had the pleasure uh, in one of his last meetings to hear him talk about the cancer moonshot uh, several weeks ago. I still remember my first briefing with, with Vice President Biden uh, four or five years ago, or showed up in his office. Learning number one was he had a working fireplace in his office, which I think is uh, sort of amazing. Um, and then it was supposed to be a 30 minute briefing. And after like an hour and a half of him getting so excited talking about healthcare, I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on? Like this briefing just keeps going. Uh, but it just shows his excitement uh, for the work of healthcare and patient safety and everything that we do. Um, if we can queue up slides, there we go. Um, so uh, if you think about CMS and Medicare and Medicaid and our work, um, uh, one framing comment and then I'll get to the slide. You know, we insure over 130 million people now, uh, largest uh, health insurance company in the world in terms of dollars. Uh, we spend about a trillion a year. That's over two and a half billion a day. And I think the biggest shift that we've been trying to execute on over the last six years is how do we partner and use those dollars and our leverage from policy programs and other uh, mechanisms to improve the health system, to improve health outcomes for patients. Um, and I want to start by thanking you. I want to thank you for the work you do each and every, other, each, each and every day, uh, to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, I know we've got other foundations in the room, like the Staunton Foundation that works on sepsis and providers and nurses and, and others in the room. And I want to thank you for the work you do, because I'm going to share some results later uh, that are national results. Uh, but it's not, you know, I used to drive frontline quality improvement. I'm still a practicing physician. I still take care of children in the hospitals on, on weekends. Um, uh, but it's really you out in the field that's getting these results for patients. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our system and how our system is changing and then talk a little bit about some of our quality improvement work. If you think about our system, it really is an evolving system, over, especially over the last three to five years with the public and private sector, where we're trying to pay uh, and incentivize better health outcomes for patients, uh, patient-centered care, really incentivizing outcomes, a sustainable, coordinated care system. I was on a panel with my first uh, boss at CMS, Don Berwick, who uh, was CEO of IHI and administrator of CMS when I started um, uh, several months ago, and he said something that stuck with me. He said he thought we'd had more positive health system transformation in the U.S. in the last three to five years than ever in U.S. history. I think he's right. He also, in classic Don fashion, then said, but we got a lot more work to do, because it's got to be a highly reliable system for every single patient that goes through the doors of, or the community or whatever the setting is. So I think that's our collective challenge. How do we keep doing this work to get better and better every day so that if it's my mother who's a Medicare beneficiary, or your mother or father, or your, one of my four children, that they get the highest quality care possible when they go through the system. Um, I will say, somebody asked me, I work on weekends, somebody was like, yeah, but everybody knows who you are. I'm like, no, not actually. It's kind of amazing. I just show up, and no resident or anyone barely ever asks me. They're just like, oh, a new attending here for the weekend. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so I get to see our system. Uh, I don't think anyone's like trying to do different when I'm around as far as I know. Um, so what are we trying to do? Uh, we are shifting how we pay providers. Uh, we're also really investing in care delivery in, in new ways. So high reliability organizations, integrating care across the whole spectrum of care, things like integrating mental and behavioral health care, distributing information. So we have a fundamental principle 
on data and data transparency. So, you know, if you think about over the last five years, we are pushing out as much data on quality, cost, outcomes as we can. We need to continue to do that. And our system as a whole needs to continue to push for data transparency, also interoperability, and that data flows with a patient uh, over time. Um, <coughs> This is our uh, payment systems. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of this. We originally wrote this sort of payment system from category one, which is just fee for service, paying for volume, all the way to three and four, which are alternative payment models where the provider is being paid for quality and total cost of care for caring for a whole patient. Uh, originally put this out uh, several years ago uh, in JAMA. Uh, we now have public and private payers that have come together through something called a Healthcare Payment and Learning in Action Network, and they've agreed on this categorization. And they agreed to publicly report for the first time in US history how they're paying providers. So Medicare, and I'm gonna show you this in a second, is 30 plus percent in these alternative payment models. Commercials around 25% right now, and they've both been going up dramatically over time, and we agreed we're gonna to continue to report at least annually how we're paying providers. On this next slide, it just shows you that goal. Uh, so we had a goal of 30% in alternative payment models by the end of 2016. We actually reached it a year ahead of time. I think we're on a trajectory where we could easily hit 50%. You know, this matters for patient safety because it once again helps align the incentives. That if you prevent a complication, if you prevent an event, you know, that is not only the right thing to do for patients, it's also the right thing to do for your chief financial officer, uh, for your financial outcomes as well. Um, and we're really trying to do this across the public and private sector. This just shows you graphically, the only additional point in this slide, which goes to that three to five year major shift. In 2011, we had 0% in alternative payment models. So, you know, that's a fairly dramatic shift uh, over the last five years. Um, uh, just briefly on some other things we're doing, our healthcare acquired condition program you know, we are measuring patient safety. These are a number of measures, things like central line infection and other uh, measures of infection. And we're seeing, there's actually a paper not done by a CMS employee in New England Journal recently that showed, you know, decreases over time in healthcare acquired conditions. Um, certainly some of the measures I think are probably better than some of the other measures. Um, uh, but overall, focusing on reducing harm. Readmissions in this country we're also seeing go down. Uh, significantly. Uh, not all readmissions can be prevented, but I, we're increasingly preventing the, many of them. Uh, and then as you can see on compare websites, we're increasingly focused on transparency of quality and cost information across all settings of care. I'll shift a bit to some of our quality improvement work, which is really the core of this work. Um, partnership for patients, I'm going to talk more about in a second. We're engaging heading towards almost 4,000 hospitals, so the vast majority, uh, 80, now 80 plus percent of hospitals in the US. Um, uh, we're working with clinicians, hundreds of thousands of physicians and clinicians to improve quality, to improve safety, uh, to lower cost. We're working with 6,000 dialysis facilities. We're working with 10,000 plus nursing homes, which is the majority of nursing homes in this country. This is all built on work that uh, Don Berwick actually uh, helped design some of this work. The QIO program has been along, around for a very, very long time. But we've evolved these to truly be learning networks where we're driving best practices and quality improvement, peer-to-peer -peer learning, you know, measuring uh, data, learning in rapid cycle, uh, and really, I think, continue to improve these systems over time. Much more work to do, uh, but we're seeing Results like pressure ulcers go down in nursing homes, infections go down across settings, a number of positive results. Um, I did want to briefly mention the quality payment program. Congress, in a bipartisan way, passed a statute called MACRA, biggest change in Medicare payment to physicians and clinicians, I would say, in, in US history once again. Um, really paying for quality and value and also incentivizing physicians and clinicians that go into these advanced alternative payment models. You know, we announced uh, recently, we now have over 300,000 physicians and clinicians in alternative payment models. You know, so a major shift uh, in, uh, and, and a credit, I know we've got a lot of physicians and clinicians in the room, the vast, vast majority, almost all of these are voluntary. 
um, where the physicians and clinicians are stepping forward and saying they want to care differently. I'll actually mention one oncology care model, which people thought we wouldn't get that many takers. It was an episode-based payment model for cancer care. 25% uh, of oncologists in the U.S. in the first round volunteered and signed up for the model. Um, so you're really seeing a shift in how uh, physicians and clinicians are thinking about care. And you just heard um, uh, from Dr. Levy and, so, and her and so many leaders in the field are driving this transformation. Transforming clinical practice, you know, we do realize we've got to work with physicians and clinicians, including in small rural settings. This is a actually $600 plus million dollar investment uh, over uh, four to five years. Uh, really supporting these physicians and clinicians to improve quality, to improve safety, uh, working with them, peer-to-peer -peer learning once again. Um, partnership for Patients I want to spend a bit of time on. Uh, Don Berwick actually launched this um, in, in 2011. Uh, this uh, really focused on uh, making care safer, uh, first in the hospital setting, but now we've expanded to other settings uh, over time. Um, this shows the three iterations. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. We've got acronyms in government that you don't have to memorize. The HINs and now the HINs, and I can't even say my own acronyms, but they're all networks um, that are around improvement, innovation, driving change. What's not on this slide I think is important. We started with 10 areas of harm. Now we've added things over, over time. So we added sepsis. We added culture of safety. We added PD, uh, an array of pediatric measures. So we're basically, these networks, you know, cohorts of the network will come forward and we say, you know, who wants to work on sepsis? You know, that one, we had literally thousands of hospitals that want to engage and work on sepsis. Still a lot more work to do uh, in the sepsis arena, uh, but we're seeing, you know, people expand to really focus on all cause harm and how do you, you know, have a culture of high reliability that could eliminate uh, or significantly reduce uh, harm in your hospital setting. Um, this is the big slide with the results. So uh, this is Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality random sample chart review, about 30,000 charts. So gold standard data source to uh, orient you to the data. From 2010 to the end of 2014, um, uh, and we're about to get the 2015 data, um, uh, actually, the slide's wrong. It's 2010 through the beginning of 2015. I apologize. 21% um, uh, reduction in harm. That's 125,000 lives saved. Um, $28 billion in cost savings, over 3.1 million infections, adverse events, injuries avoided. And I, the reason I want to pause on this slide for a second is, think about what that means. How many people that is, that went home to their loved ones instead of a horrible, tragic event occurring. Uh, some of you have heard this, I apologize, but um, you know, I had an infant that I took care of when I was in training that died from a line infection. And the attending, because they thought that at the time, said these things happen, they're not preventable. We now know they're preventable, and we're preventing them at national scale. I have residents, speaking of sepsis, that I'm helping to train that used to always say, oh, you know, it's rule out sepsis. And I'd be like, sepsis, you better not just sepsis, is, you're ruling out serious bacterial infection. Sepsis is a clinical diagnosis. Here's the things you should be looking for, et cetera. They're now getting it. They actually talk about it in a different way. They're looking at data in a different way. I think there's a culture of the trainees now that is trending, I think, actually in the right direction in terms of systems of care. You know, do we always get it right? No. Do we need to do more work to really focus on training at every level on safety and systems uh, to improve care? Yes, of course. But I think we're seeing a shift uh, really focusing on how do we provide a truly highly reliable system that is not dependent on any one person, that has a series of mechanisms to catch and prevent safety events before they occur, 
And if, uh, if there is a clinical deterioration that you're able to rescue quickly, I really think you're seeing a shift in the care model. Um, so, uh, you know, what's causing the results? I do think clear aims mattered. We've been very clear about goals, very clear about measurement. I think quality improvement work at truly national scale. So we actually got some pushback. Why didn't we start smaller, go much slower? Um, you know, I think doing this kind of work at scale matters. I don't think we have time to wait, if you will. I do think the payment changes help. They definitely at least remove barriers so people invest in quality improvement. Innovation uh, throughout the Asian and individual and organizational commitments. So it's leaders like you. One of the things I love about this conference is the commitments that people make. And then better go home and follow through on. Um, but the commitments uh, that people make to change care. I mean, it's you making these commitments to drive change. Um, you know, how do we approach the work? We do think this is aspirational work, that it truly is a mission-driven work. We're trying to empower our networks to be learning networks and truly learn in rapid cycle. Uh, we do hold uh, people accountable for measuring and trying to improve at all times. And uh, I'll show you some quotes in a second, but it really brings, I mean, this is what physicians, clinicians, nurses want to do. So I think it really does bring them back to the joy and work that brought them uh, to medicine in the first place. Um, I won't read you all these quotes, but a few of them. You know, watching hospitals with a willingness to jump in and work together. Impacting change in communities and with patients nationally, I love my job. Um, our high reliability work, which has allowed us to better connect with the C-suite, as well as more broadly across quality and safety teams. Seeing our hospitals achieve successes, observing more transparency, and feeling that we were working in this work together. These are all real quotes from people that were engaged in the Partnership for Patients Network. Um, so I will, um, I want to end a little bit with some work that um, is still a work in progress, which is our patient and family engagement strategy. Uh, we recently, we had a quality and safety strategy we put out from CMS about four years ago, I've been executing on four or five years ago. We put this patient, patient or person and family engagement strategy out just recently. And it really is how do you have person and family engagement in all of our work? Quality measurement, quality improvement, policies, how do you have deep co-creation of this work, which we think will drive better results. Um, and I know there's some uh, patients, families, and caregivers uh, in the audience. I heard some of those powerful stories today. Uh, and we think it can be a critical uh, driver to better results. Um, I think we're still learning how to do this well. Uh, but we have a fundamental hypothesis that deep patient family engagement in the quality improvement work will drive better results. I will say, you know, I learned this back when I uh, helped lead quality improvement work in Cincinnati Children's. The patients and families on our quality improvement teams, which we always had them there, were always the most important. Um, they always were the most important people at the table, helping us think through our systems and where we had holes. Uh, the one other thing, to tell you there, I used to have my fellows, and they hated this each time I'd tell them they had to do this when they started, but then it was, they always said it was one of the best parts of their fellowship. One day I would tell them, go to the ER, find a child with complex illness, you just sit with that child and family all the way through their hospitalization, and you're gonna go home with them when they're done. You have to ask them if they're willing to participate as well, obviously. Um, <laughs> amazingly, people were best learning experience. To see how long you wait for radiology, to see the blood draws, to see the, you know, medicine's not quite right. You know, our fellows that then were becoming to become hospital medicine physicians realized how many holes, and we were uh, a relatively robust system um, in a lot of ways, but still had so many holes and so much of our care that wasn't as patient and family centered as it needed to be. Um, so what can we do together? And I'll, I'll give some time back. Um, so I'll cede eight minutes to Vice President Biden, um, uh, <laughs> to the senator from Delaware. Um, uh, you know, the first one's most important, eliminate patient harm. 
So this is on my slides even when I'm not at this conference. Um, focus on data and performance transparency, test new innovations, relentlessly pursue and pay, prove patient outcomes. I want to end where I started. I want to thank you uh, for the work you're doing across the country. Collectively, we are improving patient safety in this country. I will say I showed those numbers uh, earlier, the big reductions. I have a chart that also shows there's still about one in 10 patients that are getting injured in some way as they go through a hospital in America each and every day. And that's way too many. And so how do we keep driving that number lower and lower and lower uh, so we have the safest possible systems for all the people uh, that we care about? Thank you for your work. Really appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jim DeFontes.